Welcome to New Release Review, part of the Movie Friends podcast. My name is Seth. Today we're talking about Trap from 2024, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. We will be discussing spoilers throughout this entire episode, so if you haven't seen Trap, I really don't know what you're doing with your life. You've had a few days to do it. You really should go rectify that. Check out the film and then come back and finish listening to this. My guest for today is Matt Belenke. He's a full-time lawyer and part-time film critic and indie movie producer. And very excited to have you on, Matt. How's it going? Hey, it's going well. I'm really excited to uh, talk about this newest hit of the summer, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and uh, big fan of your podcast, so I'm excited to, to be on as a guest. Oh, hey, thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's a trap summer. We went from brat summer to trap summer. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were able to catch the film on Friday, right? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, yeah. I, I saw it at a 445 screening at downtown Brooklyn Alamo with a pretty packed audience for that strange of a time to see a movie. Yeah, yeah. I think the theater was having a real riot. There were very few people looking at their phones throughout the film. And that's credit to the, I think, craft that M. Night Shyamalan displays every time he releases a new movie. But especially this one, this felt more kind of present uh, than his some mm. of his older films, more so than some of his, uh, I guess, newer films, I should say. But there was an excitement in the air and... Uh, yeah, um, I went with a couple friends, and one was laughing hysterically half the time. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell if that was at the movie or, or with it or both, but right. I, th I think either is a victory. Right, right, right. I went Thursday, maybe like a 9.15 showing. There were people in the audience. It wasn't that full, but uh, there were quite a few people who all throughout the previews were speaking at full volume. And even when the movie started, they were a little rambunctious, but within the first 10 minutes, everyone was locked in and <laughs> I did not need to uh, become the uh, police of the theater and <laughs> request people to be quiet. And I, I really thought it was going that way. So what were your general first impressions of trap? Yeah. I mean, I thought the, movie was entertaining throughout. And I mentioned this in, in my review that I wrote for Nighttime Magazine, uh, if people want to check that out. But I mentioned that it feels almost like M. Night was slow playing a big hand in poker, uh, to use mm. a metaphor, where the first two thirds, a lot is happening and yet not as much uh, as you'd like. Yeah, It's a movie of glances, of surveillance, of looking to the corner of the frame and subtleties. And it's uh, less of a film of like things actually happening or bombastic things happening. I thought there was no mm. sudden death was a film I thought about a good bit. The Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, Die Hard ripoff movie, which is yeah. <laughs> a, a, a great time. Is that hockey? That's right. Yep. Hockey. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's like get set in game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Van Damme plays a hockey arena cop, I guess, who's takes his two kids to the game and he has to rescue uh, the arena before bombs go off in, in the stadium yeah. <laughs> as a hostage situation persists up above with powers booth. But um, that film had these kind of big explosions and it was going, I think for a different tone. Uh, but this film was kind of a lot of minor moments that built off each other really well, whether it was, you know, the constant run-ins in the movie with Josh Hartnett mm his character Cooper and uh, his daughter's friend's mom, who's like this, you know, very kind of outgoing mom. Uh, she has a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas about hanging out with the kids. Um, <laughs> the, the, the beef between the, the children and the teenagers is kind of unexplained in the film, but it, but it exists yeah. clearly. Yeah. Th this was a really, I thought about Hitchcock a lot while watching this and he's used moments of Hitchcock's work throughout, I think his filmography, but this one seems to be the one paying the most homage to it. And uh, Psycho being the kind of obvious one and, and Richard Brody wrote about it really well in, uh, in the New York, his New Yorker review, um, mm. where he also kind of gave it a, um, 
qualified or modified, uh, um, you know, thumbs up in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel the same. I think the first two thirds of the movie is really strong when they're in the actual concert, when they're there. When it leaves the concert, it kind of loses steam in a big way. And maybe that's uh, Ammonite's daughter's acting that is subpar mm-hmm. compared to the rest of the film. But I think it's also yeah. kind of the story becoming less interesting, more predictable about where it's going. And, and just uh, it, it felt in that sense like speed, right? Where they when they leave the bus. Sure. <laughs> it's it's good, but it's like, eh, you know. Right, right. right. It does, it or does, Con Air, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, yep. where it's like, okay, maybe it's over now. Oh, it's not over. Oh, after this chase, it'll be, oh, it's it's not over. Oh, John Cusack is getting on a motorcycle. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. There's like a crane on a truck being yes. ridden through a Las Vegas tunnel. What is going on? <laughs> Yeah, it, it had that um, sort of. Uh, I thought about speed a bunch mm. in, in terms of the momentum of the film and the kind of build up of it, um, but that still doesn't take away from the enjoyment. And, and I I liked Shyamalan's restraint as, as a director in this film. I, I thought he um, it was almost a film of where less things happening actually meant more and kind of kept the audience on, on their toes. Um, at a higher rate than if he actually had, I don't know, random like bombs going off in the theater or more um, maybe killing and murdering. There wasn't really that happening. There were moments where it could have happened and almost did, but it was a lot of sort of uh, C and D grade um, assaults by Josh Hartnard on, on the various staff at the at the arena. Speed is a great comparison. I felt the same thing once we leave the trap you know the main trap i guess we can call it (laughs) yeah i was like oh okay you know maybe it will end here and then oh no we're we're going for it and it felt like we just kept going for it and going for it i'm a big loud mouth when it comes to trailers revealing too much and so in that aspect i was pretty refreshed that there was more to this movie than what I thought that there was. I just didn't know where we were going and when it was going to end. I will say I, I very much enjoyed this movie. I had a very good time with it. I think that this is like close to his funniest movie. I would say the visit has a lot of humor in it, but this felt like everyone gets a chance to be pretty funny, especially Josh Hartnett, who I mean, God bless Josh Hartnett. He he's really good in this. He he goes from really silly to very very stressed to very very scary, and I I liked him throughout this. I don't know how well everything worked for me, but I will definitely watch this again. And I I don't watch a I don't rewatch a ton of movies, but I I was like I need to see this again now that I know exactly what it is. But I, I would have called this movie um, a series of traps <laughs> because it basically boils down to Josh Hartnett escaping over and over and over and over all the way to the very end. And I was like, is this like a movie about like Houdini? And then I thought about his name. You know, we only ever hear him called Cooper. And that reminded me of D.B. Cooper, you know, the famous story of the guy who like jumped out of the airplane and was never found. Hmm. Whether or not that's on purpose or not, I I doubt it. I'm probably reading too much into that. Towards the end, I was like, oh, M. Night, please, please do not roll this into the glass unbreakable uh, world where this is another superhero or supervillain. And it turns out that like his power is he can escape any trap. You know, like I, I, I fully expected... <laughs> somewhere towards the end that it was going to be rolled into that because it did feel like almost like a supernatural ability to just escape any trap, especially the scene in the limo (laughs) when he escapes a limo that is surrounded by people by doing a costume change and then a fake dummy build and an escape within like, 15 seconds 
that was that was quite interesting. And you know, if you're listening and you're very upset, I'm not trying to like poke holes in this. This is a fantastical story, and there are fantastical elements to it, and I can. I can appreciate that. And like I said, I had a good time with it. I was laughing. My heart was pounding for pretty much the whole time that he was in the concert. And apart from pushing someone down the stairs and, you know, blowing up a fryer, there's a lot of tension from like almost nothing happening. Like all, all you really see is the net kind of closing, but it's all in Hartnett's response to information that he's learning and like close calls, but nothing, nothing actually happens. <laughs> so we already talked about him a little bit. Uh, Josh Hartnett as Cooper. How did you feel about him? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in total agreement with you in the sense that this is a real tour de force performance by, by Hartnett every, in every which way. And I don't think he's ever really been given um, mm. the keys to have a role that kind of tackles everything. Like he's funny. Um, as you say, he's, uh, charming. He's like, mm-hmm. he's cool. He's a, a goof. He's a bit of a, you know, a try hard dad. He's mm-hmm. there are a couple of moments early on where he, uh, attempts to use or says jelly, uh, t- <laughs> to me jealous and then tries using crispy in a sentence and his daughter mm-hmm. sh- shuts down both opportunities. Um, and, uh, and then he also has this kind of uh, evil, sinister side that we, I think we, we know that side more so um, just by the, the history um, with the actor and, you know, looking back even at the faculty. Um, sure. Where it was kind of this, you know, emo high school guy um, that you couldn't really, you know, he was kind of a bad boy. I think that was a image right. that had had early on in his career, whether it was that or Virgin Suicides, um, a bad boy heartthrob, um, but with like a little edge. There, there's something, there's something more there. He's not just Paul Walker or Freddie Prince Jr. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's someone with with a little bit more muster and, and talent. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, this film, it, you're right. It's a series of traps, or right, constantly M Night's throwing something at us. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I agree. I think it is his funniest movie in a long time. I, I thought of the happening a lot. In, sure. And whether that movie was intentional or uh, <laughs> c- campy humor is another debate altogether. Um, yeah. Because, you know, the casting of Mark Wahlberg, I think, is a science teacher in that. And he's given some of the worst lines. But Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I, I'm I'm firmly on the intentionally funny side of the happening. I love it. And when you look at the cast, you've got Zoe Deschanel, Mark Wahlberg, uh, John Leguizamo, and all of them, all of them have done serious roles, but they have also all done comedic roles. Mm-hmm. And so you have people who, who know both sides of the coin and I think can live in that <laughs> confusing zone. Yeah. <laughs> Where if it was, you know, mostly Bruce Willis, who I know, you know, started out doing Moonlighting and he, he's been funny before, but. I think the cast gives away the intention behind happening, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. If you disagree, which many people do, send us an email, moviefriendspodcast <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, and looking at Ammonite's filmography, it's also really impressive that he's been able to create this career of really profitable movies, and he's been able to do it on modest budgets right like maybe the highest Mm -hmm. budget he'll get is 20 to 30 million i think this was Mm -hmm. 30 um last i checked and uh it's it's already made 20 million this weekend and he creates these modest blockbusters that feel they feel bigger than they are and and yeah the other thing is is that he's not using many set pieces or these expansive spaces in, in his films at all really right that he's not um, Brian De Palma in that sense. And he's not uh, Steven Spielberg. Um, although I think, you know, especially his early work, there was a lot of Spielberg in those sure. films. And, and even throughout, I think that uh, that sentimental um, ability to have 
uh, a movie involve parents and their kids and have a familial edge to them is something that Spielberg was so good at. And it's something that M. Night had also, despite like the camp and the genres that he's working in, he's always able to have things that are relatable at, at the core, at the center. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's, you know, Haley Joel Osment and his mom, their relationship and, and the sixth sense. But that's really fascinating. You know, you look at his movies and maybe besides like the last airbender or after earth. Sure. These are movies that are in houses there or they're enclosed communities. There's a, a limited number of settings and locations in his films. And yet they make a lot of money. A lot of people go see them. Uh, they seem to kind of transcend whatever genre he's working in. He's able to make, he's able to make the movie feel bigger than the, um, some of its parts. Mm-hmm. Which, which is not something you could say for nearly any, you know, filmmaker of his um, class in, in, in terms of box office receipts throughout history. That's not right. Usually it's people working, um, the, the bigger the movie or the more it makes, uh, the, the more spaces you're, you're playing with and the more locations. Right. Um, right. And that's a testament, right, to really good storytelling and uh, also being able to be so talented with the camera. I, I think this film is, again, it knows um, kind of where to look and, and where to seek out moments and frames. And uh, I thought of Snake Eyes. Snake uh, Eyes, yeah, yeah. You know, a good bit. And not just because that's another movie set in one location at a boxing match in, in Atlantic City. But that film also is kind of about Nicolas Cage looking at surveillance video, um, looking around the arena, what is happening on the corners of the frame? What are, you know, the various doors and ins and outs and puzzles that that are located in these places? And this film also, I think to draw the viewer in, does a really nice job of doing that through uh, Josh Hartnett's perspective as a character. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Snake Eyes is great because you're watching every person who's whispering in someone's ear, everyone who's handing something to someone else. You know, it's it makes you a detective. It doesn't make you like a passive viewer. You are trying to. And I loved in uh, in Trap when the stairs go up for the for the guest um, performer and he's looking down through and he's like, hey, what do you think's down there? And I found myself you know, whenever the camera was on that hole, I'm looking and I'm like, can he fit in there? Is he going to do a running slide? You know, kind of, but I wanted to highlight something that you mentioned about, uh, his filmography, you know, obviously sixth sense, a lot of it is based around conversations between, you know, Bruce Willis and Haley Joel or the, the son and the, the mother. It's a lot of conversations. And like you said, it's a lot of locations in, in homes and in houses. And there's this element of being trapped or being restricted throughout so many of his movies. So Sixth Sense, uh, Unbreakable uh, opens it up a little bit more, but Signs, you know, it's people confined and you're trapped by the (laughs) cornfield, you know, a little bit. Knock at the Cabin, obviously. The Visit, uh, The Village is about a secluded place that you're trying to escape from split the characters are imprisoned Mm -hmm. after earth will smith is confined because you know broken leg lady in the water is all about the apartment building obviously trap is (laughs) you know that's a pretty pretty simple one but whether or not it's through you know an economical mind and just an efficient mind in writing and creating the story if he's thinking of this as a producer (laughs) you know as he's writing it's it's very very impressive that he's been able to tell so many different stories over and over again about confinement and about imprisonment and about an inability to escape like even bruce willis's character you know going back to the sixth sense this idea of not being able to move from one place to another and like what you need for like a breakthrough or so many, so many characters in all of his movies have this breakthrough moment. And, uh, but yeah, really, really great point. Um, 
And I've, I've never really thought about it like that, but I just pulled up his whole filmography on Letterboxd and I just went down and I was like, oh my God, these are all. <laughs> oh, and then of course, old, you know, old, they're literally trapped. <laughs> he, okay. he goes to this very exotic location and you see it like once, mm-hmm. you know, the rest of the time you're just at this beach mm-hmm. and you know, I, I, I did not love old, but again, I had a pretty good time with it. Mm-hmm. You know, when I think back on it, it's not with anger. It's a, <laughs> it's a fond, fond, uh, fond memory. Yeah. And, and, and that's credit to someone who is never boring, I think in his work. And, and, uh, that goes a lot to the camera work, um, mm-hmm at stake in in a lot of his films, the frames know where to go and they know how to make an exciting shot um, or they know how to build suspense. That's been his MO for forever since he came into um, Hollywood. The other way to look, I think at his filmography is that there's a lot of home invasion plots Mm -hmm. kind of sprinkled Mm -hmm. throughout, but he's tackling them through various genres, right? It's the, the fairy tale movie with lady in the water or it's aliens with science it's uh, found footage with the visit. It's home invasion with knock at the cabin. Six cents. He's got ghosts. Right. And uh, with trap, it's kind of his first serial killer entry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this film is interesting to compare to another movie with a female uh, FBI profiler, uh, Long Legs, which came out you know recently. Right. Um, right. And uh, the casting of Haley Mills in this film is the. The, the psychologist uh, Haley Mills played in the original Parent Trap, so you know so another head nod by uh, Eb Knight there. But y- you're right; it is a really like humorous film where uh, nearly every character has some form of comedic relief uh, here, mm-hmm. like uh, even including the FBI profiler, who seems like the least competent uh, person in the in the whole arena, where she's like. You know, and this is the part where he's going to pull the lever for the fire yeah. alarm, as we see it. Jo- <laughs> Cooper considered right. the, the fire alarm. Um, but yeah, this the movie kind of speaks to the um, incompetence of uh, police authority in, in general. Like, you know, there's several scenes where Cooper weasels his way in to like a SWAT team meeting. Yeah. Scout. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, th- I thought those were brilliantly done. And Hitchcock also was really deft at doing that with his films, towing the line between utter fear and suspense, but also with like a wink and a head nod and a kind of jab. Um, And, you know, if this film has psycho elements, which is his visions of seeing his mom, or, you know, there's like an older lady in the bathroom, it's kind of obvious it's probably his mom who he just saw and... uh, she shares a resemblance to the FBI profiler in, in a way and looks wise. If, if Psycho is one of the um, films he's pulling from here, the other Hitchcock film that, that I thought of was Shadow of a Doubt, um, which is a fantastic movie that I recently saw on like a YouTube uh, link and uh, it still held up really well. And mm. um, that was another film where there was a, a niece who kind of knew that her uncle was a serial killer, but he also knew that she knew. So there was a cat and mouse between them. Mm. Um, and the last third of the movie becomes that uh, between um, M. Knight's daughter, the Lady Raven, the singer of, of the right. concert, and Cooper's character. The other point I wanted to kind of touch on is I think when people criticize M. Knight's work, it comes from the angle of, his dialogue is not realistic, is one big argument here a lot. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. And especially with this film, I, I've, I've heard that uh, rear its head again. Uh, the dialogue is not realistic. And number two, everything, not, nothing makes sense. It's nonsensical, right? That's not what would happen. Um, a, I, I think that's um, just kind of really poor analysis because there is a sense of camp and and the sense of fun and it doesn't necessarily Mm -hmm. just because the dialogue is written like that i don't think he's trying to emulate a reality this isn't a richard linklater film um right 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 right. this isn't godard he's going for something else and uh and and also yeah the nonsensical part i mean 
how, how many films have we seen? It? Nearly every Hollywood movie is nonsensical, right? To some right. extent. Right. And like, yeah, it, it is ridiculous that he keeps escaping. And, and he has like a, <laughs> a, a door, uh, you know, four foot door in his uh, pantry that he uh, sneaks away from. And then next thing you know, he's driving in a limo and a SWAT suit. But, right. you know, that's also part of the fun uh, of the genre. That, that's also how thrillers i think live and breathe in, in general there has to be um a suspension of disbelief w- when you watch an ad night movie and when you're watching a, a thriller um and if you're going in there from the perspective of oh that's that's not what happened that's not reality um i think you're just losing yourself and or you know it, it just it, it'll affect the experience of, of uh, how you watch the movie in a negative way that's uh, i think unfair to the the filmmaker and the story yeah, it's very hard to explain to someone, you know, Star Wars would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> so many things would never happen. And we want a good story. And I think that if you're inclined to believe what you're watching is a good story, you're very forgiving. And if you don't like what you're watching, you're not forgiving. And so all of those things that are acceptable and or looked over are now landmines that you're, you know, picking apart. Yeah. The Haley Mills thing. It's so funny. I did not know that that was Haley Mills. I did not recognize her. And I was like, how funny is it that M night was like, (laughs) let's make a movie about a parent who's trapped. Oh, I know. We'll get that. We'll get the woman from the parent trap. It's it's just, it's so funny. And then obviously there's nothing funny about childhood illness or childhood leukemia. And yet he turns that whole bit with him in his cameo in this into like a really funny kind of moment. And I just think that, I think that this isn't meant to necessarily be as thrilling as it is entertaining and people might have a problem with me splitting the hairs that closely. And I think where the major confusion comes in is that Hartnett genuinely is very, very (laughs) scary at a few key moments. Like he's not a bumbling crook. This isn't like watching oceans 11, you know, handle little unexpected things come up in their plot. This is like someone who, who kills people but the almost complete lack of on-screen violence in this also kind of lends us towards like, what is he trying to do? Because if he wanted to show us Josh Hartnett cutting people up, he, he could have done that. And a lot of his movies are pretty lacking in like out and out violence and blood and gore. And for someone who's, you know, at this point, pretty, pretty close with, uh, horror and you know scary movies you know apart from the the uh, bone breakings uh, uh, scene on beach and you know the gun wound from Sixth Sense it's mostly about like what we're expecting and what you know what we don't see as much as we as we could but yeah I I uh, <laughs> I very much enjoyed Hartnet and I think think like you mentioned earlier back when he was a young person acting there was a moment in time where he could have split off you know he did 40 days and 40 nights and he could have gone that route and i think his charm and kind of sense of humor helped him work through like a role like that but then yeah you've got the faculty and virgin suicides he goes into pearl harbor and other movie and then a little bit later, like 30 days of night stuff. He did the Halloween movie. So I think he avoided the, uh, the path of like the teen heartthrob. <laughs> and then everyone was like, Oh, he disappeared. Shows up in Oppenheimer again. And it was, it was very nice to see so many people very excited that he was back in that role, dramatic role. And this just felt like the cherry on top of, you know, riding that Oppenheimer wave and i hope that he continues to do you know interesting things after this because that scene when he's confronting lady raven 
and he starts talking about carbon monoxide and he's like, you know, you've been looking for me. That was great. And then the scene at the end with Alison pill, uh, where he's just sitting at the table, like taking his shirt off and, you know, he, he, he finally realizes how all of this has kind of come about. I, I thought that that was great. Yeah, no, no. Um, Hardnut was was outstanding, and he's aged really well. He he looks just almost a f- just a few years older than that person we used to know in, in the early yeah. aughts, late nineties. Um, and he has a very domineering presence on screen. He's a very tall guy, and I think we saw that mm-hmm. in Oppenheimer a lot. Um, mm-hmm. He has great command of the room, and uh, the the Black Dahlia was an, was another picture that sure. Um, for, you know, it wasn't that great of a, of a film or, or good film even, but he's memorable in those roles. He's always, a um, a valuable figure and, uh, and you're right. He never took the, um, the heartthrob route and he chose interesting films. I think, you know, some misses, but he chose to work with good directors, whether it was Black Hawk Down or, mm-hmm. um, Pearl Harbor or Sin City. Uh, he mm-hmm. worked with people who at the time were uh, ascending or, you know, at the top of Hollywood. Um, and uh, he was able to work in a lot of good movies. Um, and, um, you know, going back to another point you, you make, which is a great one about the the lack of gore and blood uh, in M. Night's work in general. But uh, of the 16 films that he's directed, only two of them are rated R. And that's The Happening. Wow. Yeah, the happening and knock at the cabin. That is also a, a testament to, you know, he's working in these genres that any other time, just about that you see a sci-fi movie nowadays, or you know, the last twenty years. Anytime you see a sci-fi movie, a ghost movie, um, a serial killer movie, uh, in whichever genre he plays, and those movies are usually rated R, right? And there's an aspect of those films where they're more straight horror or there there has to be some element of gore jump scare um and he's been good at the subtle jump scares and moments like that in his work but um the fact that he's able to almost glorify the pg-13 rating in a way right and keep it going um is also a testament to um someone who still understands that sometimes rating doesn't matter it's not about um, showing blood or or not, but it's it's right. how it's how you do it, how you go about um, uh, creating a, a uh, environment and and, and framing uh, images in a certain way that he's that he's so good at, and uh, and yeah, the other character, you know, on the topic of Hartnut, um, I thought of Anthony Perkins a lot from Psycho mm. in this performance, someone who's able to both be kind of sweet and affable to um, Marion Crane, played by Janet Lee in that movie. But then with, uh, you know, just a split second, he's giving that creepy smile or just a right. little bit too much, or he's looking through the peephole. Um, but you believe it. You believe both sides of it. Um, and there's a lot of Anthony Perkins in, the, in this uh, performance by, by Hartnett. And, uh, Dare we say another excellent cameo? Um, <laughs> <for them. laughs> it, it was pretty funny. I, I I thought it was good. I I like the Shyamalan cameos. Like mm-hmm. I know people who are not on his side really find it just to be one of the more annoying parts of him. Like, oh well, why would you put yourself in? And I I always you know. I, I like it. I think it's funny. And in and, and this one, like I said, it's kind of a funnier movie and he's not being like, Oh, I'm the goofy uncle of this person, but just how Hartnett plays him, you know, how he manipulates him. It's, it's, it comes across as pretty funny. Yeah. No, totally. You, you were talking about how great the movie is and how our eyes are kind of drawn all over the place. I just wanted to highlight uh, the cinematographer, Sayambu, Mook Deprom, and he's mostly known at this point probably for Challengers, but he also did the Suspiria remake, uh, Call Me By Your Name. He also did Memoria, the uh, 
We're Ass of the Cool movie from 2021. I don't know if anyone has seen that. That's the one that was like going to tour eternally throughout theaters. Really great and really great looking film. Um, so, you know, this dude is no slouch. And <laughs> if 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 they wanted Trap to look different, it would have. You know what I mean? Like it's between between Shyamalan and uh, the cinematographer. I think they knew knew what they were doing and they knew how to use the space that the whole. Um, is it called a concourse? What What's the area? Not not in the theater or not, you know, not in the stadium, but where all the little shops are. That might be right. Yeah. Or like the lobby. I guess it's not the lobby. Yeah. I think you're right. It's the concourse. Yeah. Yeah. It usually like runs around the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I was very curious because like you mentioned, M Knight's making PG 13 movies. That's another kind of producer <laughs> minded thing is, Hey, let's open this up to a wider audience. So I was like, I wonder how many of these sets they used and how many they just redressed and shot it different ways, you know, did like a Gattaca type Mm -hmm. (laughs) Gattaca type thing. And even within the crowd, I was like, it gives a sense of a large arena, but I was, I was curious how much of that was real and utilized, uh, utilizing either CGI or, you know, camera tricks to make it appear like there were more people there, but mm-hmm. yeah. So Hartnett is joined by Ariel Donahue, who plays his daughter Riley in the movie. And going into this, a lot of people had a lot of theories. You know, everyone always assumes that there's going to be some massive twist because it's a Shyamalan movie. And so they were theorizing that Riley was really the killer or perhaps <laughs> The guy on the video was the killer. I was kind of kept in. I I think that the movie gives you enough to make you question whether or not Hartnett is the killer until it's fully, fully revealed. Obviously, he's doing diabolical things, but maybe he's just trying to avoid. I'm not sure. When he kept seeing his mom, I thought, oh, perhaps his mother was a victim of the actual butcher. And he took it upon himself to capture this person and he is going to kill him. I don't know, you know. So twofold question. One, how did you feel about Riley? And two, was there a moment where you suspected that she or someone else was the killer? (laughs) Um, Yeah, great question. I think I liked Riley's performance. I think she pulled off like the excited um, teen in a state of jubilation and, uh, also someone who's questioning why her dad keeps leaving to go somewhere, mm-hmm. to go to the bathroom or wherever he was saying he'd go um, at one point to get a t-shirt. Um, I, I never thought that she was serial killer. I did think that maybe it was someone else in the arena mm-hmm. and it wasn't. And Josh Hartnell was just some like weirdo who's obsessed with the actual butcher guy mm-hmm. um, or, or someone trying to emulate him or, um, kind of copycat murder the, the, that did cross my mind uh, because really early on in the film, we see him look at his phone with mm-hmm. the, with the uh, random guy. I think his name is Henry maybe, or as a, I forget what, what the guy's name is, but he's clearly in a basement and the camera's watching him. Um, I think two MVPs of the movie uh, were a Jonathan Langdon as Jamie, who's the, yes. <laughs> Who's the you know way too open to share confidential information or high security information to a random person, aka you know, Cooper, uh, Josh Hartnett, just because um, he was really nice to the to his daughter and to the staff about the T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was hilarious and and and, and really good, and uh, also Kid Cudi as the thinker. Uh, the- <laughs> <laughs> who uh, literally berates an assistant to get him yes. to open a door at some point and gives uh, Hartnett a uh, kind of romantic gesture or, or stare mm-hmm. down as he exits. Mm-hmm. Um, that was right. Again, that was playing with the c- comedic relief that we we've seen throughout the film. Um, and yeah, I mean, the last third of the movie is just 
you know, maybe either A, keep it all in the arena, what would have been a better, I think, solution to that, or do something else uh, uh, with the last third. Like, you know, why did uh, at, at any moment Hartnut or, you know, Cooper and his daughter Riley could have just exited the limo uh, instead mm-hmm. of acquiescing to Raven saying, why don't we just go to your house right now? Right. Um, they could have just walked out there and then, you know, maybe then if that happens, it would have been interesting to have um, Lady Raven start stalking, you know, sure. start, tell the limo driver, hey, follow him and start following, um, kind of surveilling him in, in a series of days. That would that would have been interesting. I think that would have been kind of neat to do. Uh, but what it becomes where suddenly the family's involved and Alison Pill, who's kind of playing just a clueless um, a wife to some degree, but also she's, um, she, you know, it turns out she, she, there, she does play a role in suspecting um, mm-hmm. Cooper as having been a killer or someone doing uh, certain misdeeds, but even that part felt predictable. Like you just knew something was going to be wrong with that cake. There was nothing else going on. Right. And right. I feel like we've seen enough movies to know where this is going. Um, and I, I thought the only exciting part of that last third was his, him escaping through all those scenarios, which are both funny and ridiculous. And okay. I'm like, oh, I kind of did that. Yeah. That, that's, that's fun. But everything happening um, with lady Raven coming home, playing on the piano it took way too long for him to get into the bathroom when she was somehow able to, you know, get on Instagram live and then uh, talk to someone about the, the lion statue. That's right. Half, right, right. Half blown off. It was, it was nonsensical, but that wasn't the reason why it was bad. It, it was just, I think poor um, maybe story development or, or, or writing yeah. uh, at that point. And it kind of, you know, hurt the movie in a way, but still you, as you mentioned earlier, right, you're you're glued in, you're invested in the film by that point. You want to see what happens, even if it is kind of, eh, or even if it is predictable. Um, but uh, I absolutely love the, I think, second to last shot of the film, the pan, the camera pan across the Did, front oh, yeah. yard. Mm-hmm. Um, you just, you, you knew the pan was going to something important, irrelevant. Um, and then it, slowly focuses on the bike wheel with the wrench um, as part of the axle missing. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's, that's awesome. That's cool. Uh, I I, I like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I think raising Kane is another, it's, it's a great Brian De Palma movie. De Palma. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of movies where someone just kept escaping out of the most impossible (laughs) situations, but the fugitive, (laughs) The Fugitive, yeah, yeah. There we go, got um, Doctor Richard Kimball. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a great example. Uh, but it, you know, I that was cool to see. I mean, he was kind of like a MacGyver, right, uh, right, 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 character. But by that point, um, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure what happened in the last third of the movie. I don't know if you <laughs> you feel similarly to to me, but there was a lot of. Too much Lady Raven, and that wasn't a good recipe because I thought the combination of her acting and the story was just like, you know. um, Yeah, I think that because I I think you can do this movie in two parts, not ten. So you do the concert and we see that Lady Raven is invested in helping find this person. You know, she's, she's in on the plan. And so she's not just being used in this trap, she's part of the trap and she wants to help catch this guy. So we know as soon as it's mentioned, like, Oh, we got to get backstage. Okay. And then they go up, you you know, that they're somehow either leaving with her or disguising somehow. And so that, that part wasn't very surprising when she turns the tables on him because now she's manipulating the daughter. Right. And so she's like, Oh, I'll, I'll come to your house. I thought that that was okay, but I would have I would have preferred if it was like the concert is trap one and that's the trap for him. But now Lady Raven is trapped in his world, in his house, and he snaps and 
locks up everyone and his whole family. And you can still have the interaction with him and Allison pill because all that the movie does <laughs> is bring you, bring him and everyone to the house. He leaves and then he has to come back for it to finish. Just cut out all of that stuff with him. And then you, you take out, you know, her being handcuffed and, when the window opens, she's like, help, please. <laughs> Instead of screaming bloody murder. And then you also remove, you know, the dummy with the SWAT thing. And mm-hmm. you get rid of a lot of that. But you also get rid of a lot of runtime. And you, I think you don't lose steam. You know, mm-hmm. you can you can see all of his uh, magnetized hidden compartments and his escape hatches. And you can see all that stuff um, without what I would think are some of the more it's like, all right, what are we doing? Here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are we doing? But like I said, I did have a good time. I don't, I don't know that this is like the most well-made movie. I think that it's a really, really well-made concert sequence. I think that that whole thing, everything in it, you know, the, you mentioned the other girl's mom and how, just excessive she gets in, in uh, you know, talking with him about how they need to fix this. And she's like, don't mess with me. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's funny because of what we know about him. And, you know, and then later on when Riley goes up on stage and the daughter like throws a drink on her a- ending the movie with Jamie, who I agree. I think that he's, he's so funny and clueless as to what's happening while at the same time feeling that he's clued in because he has this like secret evidence of of photos and like he is tuned into who this killer, uh, the, 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 the killer is being tracked by the FBI. And so he thinks he knows more than everyone else. And yet he knows, (laughs) you know, the person's right in front of him and ending the film with that, like not even mid credit. It's like five seconds of credits and then boom, Jamie comes back and he's watching the TV. That's when I felt better about the whole thing. Cause I was like, Oh, he really, I don't think that he was trying to scare us with this one. He's trying to make a very entertaining movie. And I think he did. I think, yeah, I think it's very entertaining. And like I said, it shut up the two dudes behind me who were talking at full volume. So (laughs) I think it worked. Yeah, no. Um, you can never fault M. Night's work for, for being dull or, or boring or um, kind of rudimentary. And mm-hmm. the, the other f- thing that this film does so well from a kind of a storytelling perspective, at least the first two thirds, is every scene is leading to another one. It's kind of a cliffhanger after mm-hmm. cliffhanger, right? You, you see Hartnett look at the... Um, woman who's stumbling okay he's going to do something bad to her or he mm-hmm. pushes her downstairs okay he sees the frying pan from the edge of his eye that's going to lead to something else that happens um, you you know and, and the other part of this film that I liked which is something Sudden Death did as well that, that film getting another reference here um, but is uh, all the kind of labyrinthian um, to some extent, rooms and floors and concourses that exist in a stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, sudden death, you know, John claude Van Damme was literally like wandering on the ground floor in the bleachers, God knows where, under tunnels and fire escapes. Uh, parts of a stadium movie that you don't really see. And right. um, I thought this film also kind of played into that, which is, um, again, something Snake Eyes did as well. But it shows you the various, um, what happens in the other rooms in a stadium, right? You have right. whatever, 20, 30,000 people uh, packed into one space, but there's so much other stuff that goes in. There's storage rooms, uh, there's secret meeting rooms where uh, the cops are searching for sugar and he's uh, he's like a right, really right. capable, <laughs> he finds like the, the one packet. Um, I love that the code name was Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> First yes, of all. yes. I left. I out loud. <laughs> yeah. What's the code name? Oh, it's Hamilton. Um, right. When he tells the cop on the rooftop. Yeah, that's the other thing is that Hartnut 
doesn't give off like a, the, the guy you think would be a serial killer first. And that's mm. another casting, smart casting move right where um, the guys you see the cops string, you know, strongholding and uh, um, capturing throughout the film kind of just look look like dads or something. They don't give off the kind of confidence or charm that Hartnett seems to use and employ every time he's in front of police in the movie. And he mm-hmm. really, um, he's very credible in pulling off a lie or, or telling a joke to make them feel as if he's like their friend or ally and not right. a person of interest. That's another, right. you know, kind of um, skill set and, 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 uh, and knickknack that M Knight uses um, really well here. Yeah. I mean, if you want to get someone on your side, just pretend that they are teaching you something. Mm-hmm. People love to feel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, someone, someone's asking me my opinion or my advice. Oh, wow. You know, and it just in, it instantly endears you to someone because they're taking you under their wing and they're showing you, and, you know, you have secret information that they want and it puts you in a position above them when really they're pulling everything from you. <laughs> you know, they're manipulating you. Yeah. Uh, I did want to quickly before we wrap up here, I just wanted to mention the scene towards the end with Allison pill where he comes back. And I guess this is probably the closest that you could come to like a twist in this movie. It's revealed that she was very suspicious of him because he smelled like hospital medical cleaner. And so she followed him and found one of his places and left the, the, receipt for the concert tickets so that the police would find it and it would it wouldn't come back on her but she was trying to help you know tip them off without actually being involved i i'm okay with that um you know not not to get like oh it wouldn't happen that way but i was like you know at this point <laughs> You're doing all this. Just call call the cops from uh, from a public phone and give them an anonymous tip. You know, like. But I I, I liked that because I I think like you said when we're introduced to her, she just seems like totally aloof and starstruck, and you know she's like making deviled eggs, and I think it's played off a little bit silly, but then it comes back around, and what I appreciated about this is it's a story of a dude who's like surrounded by women who are constantly figuring out like what he's doing every step of the way. Like his daughter is so suspicious of him. He's like, no, 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 I'll I'll be right back. She's like, you're acting weird. And she like pinpoints it. Mm -hmm. And then lady Raven is able to one up him and get him to his house. So now she knows where he lives. So he has to kill her or he's going to be caught in a matter of, you know, moments his wife is the one who figures him out. And then yes, the FBI profiler is also a lady. So it was an interesting um, kind of uh, pattern that he puts throughout the movie is like, yeah, the women figure him out. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So you had mentioned like the whole pie thing. How did you feel during that, that interaction uh, between him and her? It was definitely I feel like it was one of those moments that had to be there to almost make um, his relationship to his family or to his wife seem relevant or seem as part of the movie. That's what it felt like, the, why that was there. Um, and maybe there had to be some sort of twist or, you know, like you said, there had to be some element of surprise perhaps. But um, I felt like it was a version of something we have seen before in in, in, mm. in movies that, I don't know if it felt like a cop out, but uh, I didn't really care for, you know, her leaving that receipt there. I was like, uh, you know, like you said, why didn't you just call the cops? Or yeah. it's it, it's it's like okay, who cares? Or yeah. or, or why didn't the police then just apprehend him right and instead of uh, going around? I think they had some suspect then, um, but. Yeah, I mean, that was maybe the film's weakest moment where you knew it had to be like the cake was going to be poisonous or something. 
Right. Um, and there's a couple of cool, I guess, uh, electroshock uh, taser scenes where <laughs> it looks like he's about to become a superhero at some or a monster. Yeah, it was it was so similar. I, I can't remember if it's split or glass mm-hmm. where they're also tasering him and he's just like powering through it. And I was like, what is what is up with Shyamalan <laughs> <laughs> to him? Like the height of power is being able to be tasered and just like <laughs> right. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, split is the other film. I've, there's a lot of McAvoy and like the multiple personalities are sure, heart, yeah. heart that has that. Uh, yeah. You know, n- not as many and, and he's not as crazed to some degree, but he, uh, he feels like a distant cousin or a not too distant mm-hmm. cousin of, right. of, of the McAvoy right, right, character right. in those, in those movies. Um, but yeah, and it, I, I almost wish that the Haley Mills character would have been, I think that would have been the more um, kind of prudent decision was to make her relationship perhaps to Hartnett more of a thing. Cause we constantly see her in the movie and she just, mich- you know, she's glancing around the stadium. She just misses looking at him because he escaped, right. escapes under a tent to help a girl who is, you know, from nearly falling over the steps. Right. Um, that, kind of uh, circling back on that relationship would have been, um, I think, better. And uh, yeah. then focusing on like him, you know, his relationship with his wife and his, and, uh, and his family was kind of like, oh, how's it going, man? You know, um, <laughs> that just feels like the wrong, the wrong way to go. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I was rooting for Josh Hartnett, obviously, to almost <laughs> run away with it. I'm like, <laughs> You know, Lady Lady Raven was wasn't doing it for me in the in the back third, and his family. I sure, was, I was sure. kind of like, yeah, he yeah. Was, when 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 she jumped on Instagram Live, <laughs> I really was like holding on to to save myself from floating off into <laughs> nothing. But I mean, you know, we we we've seen it happen in real life where the internet can solve mysteries Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, and I, I agree. Um, I was speaking with someone earlier and they were saying it's just too many convenient things. One after the other, after the other, after the other, like every, like you, you, like you said, it's like, sometimes it's as close as just someone turns away at the exact second. And then the apron that he happens to put on has someone's wallet in it that also happens to have, I I've worn aprons many times over my life. I've never once taken my wallet and put it in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but again, I think if you start picking things apart, you know, it becomes a different experience and mm-hmm. yeah, like, yeah, I had fun. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. Yeah. I think there's almost as much, um, I got m- more enjoyment out of this than I think seeing long legs. Um, mm-hmm. in a way that a film that w- was good and, and uh, um, really expertly kind of crafted and, and put together, but it felt almost too derivative of other things mm. intentionally. Whereas mm-hmm. this is, you know, a, a director who's been there, done that, doing his victory lap. Um, sure. Oh, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. And Yeah, I, I think this reeks of someone who knows what they want and they don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my daughter in this movie. I'm going to feature her singing for (laughs) minutes at a time. I'm going to skirt the line of, is this like a superhero movie? You know? And like I said, you know, between him and the cinematographer, if they wanted this to be different, it it would have been. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I think, I think that when, when a new movie comes out, and you've been waiting, you know, I've been waiting for the new Shyamalan film. I've been waiting, I've been waiting. You can be really angry, but in 20 years from now, when he's made another 10 movies, we'll be able to pick and choose and trap won't make, you know, future generations angry. Cause they'll just say, Oh, I didn't care for that. Just like Hitchcock, hmm. you know, you, you, you have your pick of all of these different films and some of them, 
there's a plenty of Hitchcock movies. I'm just, I, I just don't care for it, but I'm not like up in arms. Like this dude's the worst. <laughs> right. And, and the other uh, thing that's worth noting about M9 is that he's been self-financing. I think all yes. of his movies since the visit um, yes. in, in 2015. So he, you know, he puts um, money or he, you know, he puts money behind his, his films and he clearly bets on himself. And the, that's like the greatest thing where there's a lot of confidence to, to do that. Um, and Paul Giamatti had a quote after he shot Lady in the Water, um, a film I don't care for much. And actually mm-hmm. it might be my least favorite or it's up there. Oh, interesting. Um, even though I, that's another movie that really falls apart in the, in the last third yes. for me. <laughs> And, and the first two thirds is great. Um, but uh, Giamatti had a quote where I think M. Night told him that he loves making B movies, and I'm botching the quote, but feel like the most important movie. That's his goal mm. with every film. It's to make a B movie, but to make it feel like, you know, it, it's the thing. It's He really right. wants to take it right. seriously. And, right, uh, right, 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 right. And pay homage or treat it with care or do it as if it's his Oscars in, in, in the right, sense. Right, right. Um, and, uh, and that's what he's done his, his whole career. And, um, you know, th- this film is just someone who knows how to put together shots really well um, and knows where to aim the camera. Because when you're dealing with the settings that he's dealt with his whole career, which are limited, um, you have to make an exciting movie out of that. Uh, otherwise, right. being in the same place, same location becomes really boring. It's really easy to make that a bad movie. Um, right. but, it, but it takes a lot of skill and care and experience to um, make those entertaining, make those moments, make limited spaces um, feel as if you know they're they're bigger than, than the moment or the story they're telling. Um, and there's not many directors who who can do it on that on that stage, and not have it feel like an indie movie, you know, where it's right, yeah, right, like an intentionally small budget or yeah. Um, and, and like you said, you know, a lot of people when they start out, that's when you're making your two location, three people, two to a scene movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you're <laughs> you're praying for a location to open up to give you a sense of space and time and (laughs) breadth and then you do that maybe you do that another time and then when you get your money you're like oh okay well now i'm gonna actually i'm gonna have locations i'm gonna have and he just he he's he's lived in that zone and uh done done quite well and like you said you know to make to make a movie nowadays that is getting people excited getting people to go to the theater, making money, and it doesn't cost $200 million is, you know, everything that I think would be fixing a lot of problems in movie making right now. Yeah. You know, doing away with the idea. And and, and Long Legs, you know, as well. These movies that can be made for either $10 million, $20 million, or under fifty, and then they don't need to make 70 million in their first weekend to be a great success, you know? So my hat is off to Mr. Shyamalan for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of the the final note I'll add is that um, his dialogue and his sense of humor, I think his work or his films work in large part due to them, not in spite of them. Hmm. Um, And I'm not, sure a lot of people you know would agree with that sentiment right because his dialogue is the first thing that people are quick to right. bash or or harp on and, and then we talked about that earlier but um he has a sense of humor as a director that other genre craftsmen who are now you know um lauded and uh and fully supported like never before like a brian de palma or an alfred hitchcock um these were people who were making rather grim, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and bloody and thrilling 
films, but they always had a sense of humor. And, and mm -hmm. um, that's another thing that's not always present, even with major filmmakers, whether it's Chris Nolan or, or something right. like oh, that. Yeah. Or it's, <laughs> um, <laughs> So, it, right where the attempt at humor becomes like the only meme of the movie, where right. it's <laughs> <laughs> right. No, nothing is. I mean, I'm I'm a huge Nolan fan. It's uh, um, his films still work. Um, sure, absolutely. Right? They're, they're still great, but there is something about M Night's sense of humor now, sixteen films deep, that you can appreciate a lot more. There, there's a refre Definitely. refreshing air. And uh, kind of sigh of relief when when you're watching his films that they're they're just about having fun um, and, and and being entertained as an audience member and that's a craft that comes in and out and especially nowadays of uh, of cinema and shows that seem to exist way past their expiration date um, and uh, yeah I mean you know uh, I like this film it's not near i think the top of, of, of his of his canon mm. for me I, th I think signs is still my favorite um sure and uh i think his, his early films feel different and um and yet i i still had a really good time with this film um even with that last third that uh where you know it more or less i think falls apart um but it's not because josh hartnett is bad right. I, I think he's the the story of the film um to a large degree too uh, you know he's uh i'd be interested to see what roles he gets now what offers he yes. gets um yeah. where he's not just kind of like the hunk or the hero as he's been used before but he's a character with a little bit more depth or a little bit more edge um or villainy to him and uh we we saw that with uh with wrath of man the the guy Ritchie movie from a few years ago mm -hmm where he had a supporting role, but he was great in that. Um, and that's, uh, I, I think what we're going to see with late stage Hartnut is, is someone taking chances on anti-heroes and having his reconnaissance moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Get, get, uh, get Josh Hartnett in something like, uh, interstellar or <laughs> true detective and I, I i i think he could do either of those things at this point yeah totally yeah or uh you know put him in bug with you know, <laughs> you know, like the michael shannon movie i'd like to see that yeah um yeah there, there's a lot on display and this, this is a showcase it's a it's a really juicy role i think th this is the type of role that a lot of actors dream of getting um, right being able to unleash so many literal demons but also play with so many personalities um yeah it's, it's a real treat to watch awesome so matt where can people find you online yeah so i'm on uh twitter or x i guess they call it now um uh, yager watch 68 is my handle and uh i'll be writing and have been writing um for nighttime magazine if you want to check out some of my articles including the uh the recently published trap review um, and uh, I did a piece on Shelley Duvall and The Shining, comparing that with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and What Lies Beneath as well a few weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, feel free to check out Nighttime Mag or hit me up on X. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and there will be a link to Matt's uh, Twitter and also that article in the episode notes. So if you've enjoyed this, check him out. Definitely give him a follow and give him a read. We'd also love it if you'd give us a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Hey, are you listening on CastBox? You might be. I don't know. Maybe uh, give us a, the old uh, subscribe, you know? Give us a rating over there. Listen in on Apple Podcasts. Remember, we are trying to beat Jamie Kennedy in Apple Podcast reviews. So if you're listening over there, please help us put... The man who brought us, Son of the Mask, uh, in second place behind us. We would really love that. You can also send us an email, moviefriendspodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about Trap. Let us know what you think uh, we missed. You know, I'm sure this is a movie that as people rewatch, they're going to notice more and more things. Like I said, I kind of can't wait to rewatch it. So 
if we missed anything or if you completely disagree with us, maybe even if you do agree with us, send us an email, let us know. You can also support the show, patreon.com slash moviefriendspodcast. $5 a month gets you access to all of our additional shows. It also gives you voting rights for upcoming episodes and monthly themes. Currently, we are in August, and September's theme is up for grabs. So do you want Shyamalan September? Do you think that we should finally do a whole month devoted to Hitchcock? Maybe we do a month devoted to the Matthew McConaughey Renaissance. I don't know. The power is yours. Patreon.com slash moviefriendspodcast. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. This was a lot of fun. I was glad. I actually, I feel like I worked through this movie in talking about it with you. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of watched this and then I went on a, on a trip for two days and I was like really crazy busy. And before hopping on with you, my mind was so much elsewhere <laughs> that I was like, oh, I need to figure out how to uh, pronounce uh, Sean Levy's name. And then I was like, wait, 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 wait. I already did the Deadpool and Wolverine episode. This is trap. <laughs> so I, I appreciate, I appreciate you, uh, helping me dredge up this movie and, uh, help me form my opinion on it as we talked about it. Yeah, no, likewise. I, I felt like I, uh, I needed to talk through it with someone and, and to, <laughs> to make sense of it all. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the whole point of this show. You know, the, the hope is that someone, leaves the theater and they're so confused. They're like, what the heck was that? And then they find this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I had a great time. All right, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you again. All right. And thank you very much for listening till next time. Have a good one. Movie friends is produced by Seth Vargas and Michelle Rubenstein music by Anthony Vicora. If you like the show, please subscribe and give us a rating. It really helps us find new friends. Thanks.